Hello, everyone. It's Michael Shermer with The Michael Shermer Show, brought to you by Wondrium, a series of college-level audio and video courses and documentaries produced and distributed by the teaching company, our friend, The Great Courses, has expanded. Wondrium is a subscription service, W-O-N-D-R-I-U-M. So you subscribe for the year, you get a 20% discount, plus a free trial if you do so through this show by going to wondrium.com slash Shermer. Check it out. I was just going to tell you about one course here that I just found that I watched back in the 80s, Joseph Campbell and the Power of Myth with Bill Moyers. This is now available on Wondrium. How cool is that? There are six one-hour, well, just slightly short of that, 58 minutes. You listen to it at 1.25 speed. You can knock that off in about 45 minutes. The Hero's Adventure, The Message of the Myth, The First Storytellers, Sacrifice and Bliss, Love and the Goddess, and The Masks of Eternity. I remember that I went through my um, the Joseph Campbell phase after I uh, was religious and then not religious, and what is the meaning of myths and all that, and it's just fabulous that I, uh, you can get that now, and you can just listen to it. You can watch it or you can listen to it uh, while you're uh, commuting or um, doing chores, whatever. Anyway, so check it out. It's wondrium.com, W-O-N-D-R-I-U-M, wondrium.com slash Shermer, free trial and 20% discount. Why would you not? Take that and check it out. Just do it. If you support this podcast, support this company. It's a great company. All right. Thanks for listening. Here's our episode. Well, my guest today is David Christian. His new book is Future Stories. What's Next is the subtitle. That's a great subtitle. David is Professor Emeritus at Macquarie University, where he is formerly a distinguished professor of history and the director of the Big History Institute. He co-founded the Big History Project with Bill Gates. His Coursera MOOCs are popular around the world, and he's a co-creator of the Macquarie University Big History School. He has delivered keynotes at conferences around the world, including the Davos World Economic Forum, and his TED Talk has been viewed more than 12 million times. You beat me by a couple million. <laughs> he's the author of numerous books and articles, as well as the New York Times bestseller Origin Story, of which this is something of a sequel. Um, I've listened to, I took, um, David, I took your, uh, teaching company course, uh, uh big history, uh, and I, I don't know, a couple of years ago, whenever that came out, maybe almost a decade ago now, I guess. And I listened to the first three lectures and the last three lectures on my bike ride this morning. So at 1.3 speed, so I can knock them off at about 20 minutes a lecture. <laughs> and uh, of course I read your new book. Uh, it's really fabulous. And you opened the, uh, your, um, big history teaching company course, with a little story about somebody, when people ask you, where are you from? Or something along those lines, you have a super interesting answer because you're not just from one place. So let's start there. Where are you from? <laughs> uh, yeah, it's sort of all over the place. <laughs> um, yeah, my, my, my mother's an American. Um, my dad is English, which is pretty all pretty conventional. My mother's family was Pennsylvania Deutsch, Pennsylvania Dutch. Um, she met my dad in Turkey in the last year of the war. He was a major in the British Army. Uh, they met in what was uh, Izmir, Smyrna. Um, and uh, she tells stories about how, because Turkey was neutral, they, they, they'd go to restaurants and the Metro D would have to figure out whether they were English or German and put them in different <laughs> sections of the hotel. Of, 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 the, of the hotel. And then my dad got a job after the war in Nigeria. So I grew up in Nigeria. Um, I then went to school in England. So my accent is stuck irretrievably in the south of England. Uh, I met my wife, who is of Serbian uh, origin, in, in London, Ontario, in Canada. I'm a Russian historian. My mother was born <laughs> in Beijing. Um, and I've lived in Australia most of my life. Um, I, I'm sure I could. I'm sure I could riff a bit further on this, but 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 it 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 uh, being more serious. It, I think it 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 does mean that I have always had to have a, a, a kind of global perspective. I could never, I could never take seriously 
um, exaggerated forms of nationalism, for example. I mean, I, I, my, mm. my, my, my heart still goes pitter pat at Rule Britannia and so on, but that's something I can't help that. That's an emotional thing, but, but I, I can't take rah rah patriotism of any country seriously. Um, and uh, I think that may be one of the reasons why I've always felt that history nowadays in a global world needs to be global. Indeed, yes. And you are a, a man of the world or a global, a, a globalist in the intellectual sense anyway. Um, give us a kind of a sense of what big history is now compared to, say, in the 19th century or even before, like when, um, you know, the rise and fall of the Roman Empire in the 18th century and maybe H.G. Wells, the late 19th century and Oswald Spangler and uh, Will and Ariel Durant. You know, there was kind of a uh, an interest in big history, but it was very different from what you guys started doing in the 1990s. So kind of make that distinction uh, and put that in context. Probably, I mean, the, 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 the most modern of the 19th century big historians was Alexander von Humboldt, um, who, who really did, I mean, was, I guess, was a, a geographer and, and, and geologist uh, before he was a historian, really. But... Um, in the 19th century, I think the, the world has changed so profoundly in my own lifetime. A, a, a genuinely global vision was something that was aspired to by many historians in the 19th century, but rarely achieved. Um, the, the nationalist uh, binoculars was, was so powerful that, um, you know, you, gosh, it was the, the English historian Trevor Roper, whose seminars I attended at Oxford, who once said, who's interested in African history? You know, the, 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 the gyrations of, of primitive tribes um, don't interest us as historians. Now, I mean, that sounds just so archaic <laughs> and primitive yeah. um, when we hear it today. But it's very recent, I think, that it's been possible to take a genuinely global view of the world and to... Um, um, but, but so... so that is one of the reasons why world history and big history in their modern forms have, in the view of many historians, a kind of tainted heritage, because people remember the uh, Eurocentric, frankly racist um, historiographies of of some of the nineteenth century. 19th century historians such as such as Spencer. Um, H.G. Wells was was not at all free from the taint of of, of what today we, we we call racism of many different kinds. Today, though, I think partly the reason why I would not say that my own work or the work of world historians is completely free of Eurocentrism. I'm sure there are many subtle forms. When I worked in Korea, my Korean colleagues pointed out one or two in my own work. But I think we're in a much, much better position to free ourselves from the cruder forms of, 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 of Eurocentrism simply because we have so much more information about the world. Um, and it's not just historical informa information, it's genetic information, paleontological information about the evolution of human beings, the realisation that Africa is the homeland of our species. Um, um, but then one more really crucial thing is what I call the chronometric revolution. In the 19th century, um, any, when, even when H.G. Wells wrote, he said, dates before the first Olympiad are all more or less guesswork. We have no information about them. So, so you can write a history with a kind of Chron chronological framework that goes back 3,000 years. That Beyond that, it's all really guesswork. Well, since the 50s and the radiometric dating revolution and a whole series of other techniques, now we can do history. And this is an astonishing change. We can do history going back 13.8 billion years, and we can attach pretty good absolute dates to many of the turning points in that history. So, so that's why we can, we can do this with a sort of, we can do big history with a kind of scientific objectivity that was simply, for technical reasons, impossible in the 19th century. And, and of course, the other thing is we simply do live in a much more global world. 
Um, people have much more experience of living in con other countries, travel to other countries. And the internet, of course, is, is amazing. I mean, here we are. We're having a conversation across the, across <laughs> the Pacific in real time. Um, that's something unthinkable when I was, when I was a, a, a kid. Uh, or at least you, 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 it would have been very, very expensive, this sort of conversation. Yes, indeed. And in fact, um, speaking of futurism, I mean, almost nobody predicted that the Internet would come along along this lines and develop as it did, even though, I mean, the people working at DARPA, working on uh, World Wide Web and so on, had some clue, obviously. They were making the future in a sense, but nobody knew what the consequences of that would be economically, technologically, search engines and the whole, you know, dot-com uh, explosion economically and so forth. But just, just to kind of reflect again, uh, that, that big picture you talk about, Fernand Ber uh, Bernal um, and his uh, long durée and looking at like French history, for example, based on the kinds of work people did, the kinds of soils they had to deal with, the animals they had to work with and so on. You know, most of us don't think of history like that, but that's, that factors large into big history stories so you talk about like the development of cities is very much influenced by energy capture you have to have energy i mean then then all of a sudden you're talking you're in physics you're talking about the second law of thermodynamics and entropy and life depends on capturing energy and redirecting it and carving out a little niche of order in the chaos and all of a sudden you're talking you know physics geology <laughs> paleontology, biology, physiology, and, and, and that's the idea behind big history. You need all the disciplines to really understand uh, what, what went on. So let's, let's, let's start, start with your new book, because you're talking about time. We're talking about time here and, 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 the, and the, uh, the radioactive uh, revolution in the 1950s, so we get a better handle on time. But let's just talk philosophically, because you have an, it, this, this image of the, the kind of cocktail glass, the martini glass, where the past is the little uh, stem and then the future is this large cone or you have it another way of the, you know, the, the, the jagged line is going along and then the future is, well, it's very uncertain. The error bars are very wide, but then on the next page, so that's A series time and then you have this B series time, I'm showing our viewers here, where uh, the past is just going up into the future in a straight line. But would that, that, wouldn't that cone, that martini glass cone, collapse into the bottom would collapse into a straight line the moment the past becomes the present and future and so the cone's always there but being pushed up yes. as time unfolds yes and that that's the point where the stem joins the glass um that's the present um and uh, one, once you start thinking about what is going on it is seriously crazy um and and St. Augustine is wonderful on all the paradoxes of this. I mean, he says at one point, and I think I quote him in, in the book. Um, so he says, if there are all of these futures ahead of us, and then in the moment we meet only one of them, where do, where do they come from, all those other futures? Are they in some sort of cupboard? And they come out of the <laughs> cupboard and then vanish again? What, what's going on? Um, I, I'd love to... I, I never managed to get the opinion of a quantum physicist on this, but I have a hunch that this process of future cones, we imagine multiple futures, and we could I could not guarantee that those futures don't, in some philosophical sense, exist in some realm. And, but then when we meet the present, all but one of them vanish. I think this is very much like what quantum physics physicists call the the collapse of the um, oh God, help me help me here, Michael. What's what's the phrase? The, wave, the, the collapse wave of the, you know the probability. The the probab Thank you. Thank you. Yes, like you, I'm not a physicist. Um, I think yeah, it's <laughs> it's it's very similar. Now, whether this is just a metaphor or whether we're talking about a real Similarity. I don't know. Maybe you know the answer to that. Well, I I don't. I'm not a physicist either. But as I understand it, the the multi worlds view a uh, version of quantum physics says exactly what you just said. There's all those futures are possible until the wave collapse of the wave function happens, and then that's the one that 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 ends up that we're in. But but another version, if I get this right, is that in some other universe, 
those other possibilities do happen. And there's an infinite number of other universes and that you and I are having this conversation 20 minutes earlier, or, uh, you know, you and I are an inch taller than we were, or, you know, whatever, there's an infinite number of these versions. To me, it, I, you know, it just seems almost science fiction-y. But I think that's the idea. But what you're getting at there, but, but- I'm not a physicist. But, yeah. But, but I think, doesn't the cone, let me go back to the cone for a second, the, the martini glass cone here. Um, the, the, the question is, is, and here it is again, does that, that uncertainty up here, does that represent just our lack of knowledge about how hard it is to predict the future? Or is the future just inherently that um, random or that it has actually has that many different things that could happen, not just the limitations of our knowledge about the future? Look, what one of the again, this is this is a non-physicist trying to understand the evolution of modern science and physics. But one of the most interesting things that came clear to me while writing this book is a profound transformation in modern science, really from early in the 20th century, late in the 19th century. Um, I had not realized the extent to which Newtonian science was deterministic. So in the early 19th century, when the French mathematician Laplace talked, said if there was a creature who actually could see the position and motion of every particle in the universe, they would be able to predict the future with perfect precision. Um, now, that's the sort of determinism that I think Newton shared too. And th th a lot of 18th century confidence in science rested on the idea that the more science we learn, the more we learn about those particles and the more we will be able to predict. And H.G. Wells is probably right at the end of that line of thinking. But a whole series of changes in the late 19th and early 20th century have undermined confidence in extreme forms of determinism. Quantum physics is one. Um, I think as far as quantum physics is, is concerned, there are processes above all at the very small scale which are inherently unpredictable. Um, in mathematics uh, and in computer science, we've learned that um, no logical system is completely coherent. In, in, you, 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 there are always going to be loose ends. So what that means is, um, I think, is it, what that means is there's a bit of, I think it was uh, William James talked about loose play in the mechanism of the universe. Now that is that is profoundly important because it it opens space for choice, for free will of some kind within within limits, and also for moral responsibility. These are problems that worried Augustine. They worried theologians. Um, you know. If God is all powerful, how can how can people have freedom of will and moral choice? Well, here's the modern physics version of that same conundrum, and the answer I think is there is a little wriggle room, or another nice way of putting it that the the American physicist I think it was Anderson said, um, knowing the laws of the universe doesn't mean that we can project forward in perfect detail what the future is going to be. There is wriggle room. And that means that individual organisms actually can make choices. And those choices have a bit of influence, a little bit of influence. It's a bit like, you know, rowing a boat in a powerful current. You can steer a bit. You have a bit of control. So that leaves room for moral responsibility, and that is immensely significant at the ethical level. So that seems to be the sort of universe we live in. And it has one other consequence. It means that if you if you want to predict about the future, if you want to predict the future, you have to, as it were, scan reality, looking at different types of processes. Now there are some there are some processes that are damn near deterministic, so near that we might as well treat them as deterministic. The sun will rise tomorrow. Um, I if you want to place a bet against that, I, I will bet a lot of money um, <laughs> on the sun rising tomorrow. 
the government will demand taxes from me. Um, I will die. Um, and so probably will you. <laughs> you know, so, but there's a whole range of things. You can move across reality and you go to a, the other extreme where you find processes where we have no idea and where they, they may be, like, like if I take a, a, an, a single atom of uranium, of a radioactive material, um, don't bet on when it will break down. You can make a bet on when a lump of uranium will have broken down by 50%. And physicists know that very precisely, but not one atom of, of uranium. So, so we live in a universe with wriggle room that allows space for um, moral responsibility, but also for steering the future within narrow and rather ill-defined limits. I think that's perfectly articulated. That That's largely what I agree with. Uh, we should point out that Dan Dennett makes the point that quantum, quantum uncertainty doesn't give free will or any volition. It's just randomness. Uh, it, it, if there's just neurons randomly firing, you're, you're, you are not making any decisions. You need something else. That something else is what you just said. That is to say, uh, and, and our mutual uh, colleague and friend Steve Gould used to make this analogy of like you're in a, a channel or a canal with walls and the walls are fairly steep. You can't necessarily climb out of them. In my case, I'm not going to be an NBA basketball player because I'm only 5'7 and I'm 68 years old. Okay, so there's certain limitations that are never going to happen. But but within the walls, I can kind of bounce around in there. You know, I can do what I can do with my intelligence, my height, my personality, my interests, and and so forth. And uh, so, who is making yep. that decision? Well, I am. I, I'm making those decisions. And well, the self is an illusion. Well, I don't know. Maybe some philosophers think so, but it's a it's a good illusion. <laughs> and free will is an illusion. Yeah, maybe, but it's a good illusion. And uh, and but but more than that, I think because you know, based on your work, what you're saying on the large scale, but but individually, knowing the past gives you some idea of where that future is going and what those those channel walls are, how high they are, how wide they are, and knowing that, well, I've done this and this and this, and in the past, these were the consequences, so I think I'll do something different this time. You know, I, I'm only going to have one glass of wine instead of two because I got a headache last time I did this, or, you know, whatever it is. Well, who's making that decision? I am, right? Based on the past, projecting to the future, I think you made this analogy, you're standing there at the street to cross the street, you look at the car, it, it, the past is only you know milliseconds or whatever, but you're still looking at the past going, well, it's moving at this speed in this direction so I can time it and cross the street. That's a kind of from the past to the present into the future in a very short time scale. But really, when, when we're looking at climate change and, and so we have 30 years of data and we can project that by 2100, this is going to be the thing. So here's what we should do now, and then in 10 years, and then in 50 years, and so forth. Well, we are changing the future, or maybe maybe we're not. <laughs> you know, That's a political decision, but that does imply, well, there's some volition there. There has to be. Yeah, yeah. So let me walk back what I said earlier just slightly. Um, in, in the book, I tried very carefully to skirt around the issue of who is making the decision. Um, is there an I? Um, yes, I, I, know, I know all the prob problems around this. And I think it's, I, so I tried to avoid that particular debate, but to end up by saying that what this um, sort of wriggle room in the universe allows is the possibility of something, let's say that looks like free will, the possibility of choice. And the possibility of something that looks like purpose. Now, one of the most strongest reasons for saying this, I think, is biological, is when you look at something like E. coli. Now, one of the strongest reasons for thinking that the universe really does contain wriggle room, for me, is an argument from natural selection. If there were no choices to be made, why would not now I'm going to use purposeful language here. This is meta metaphorical, of course, but why would natural selection have built into every living organism the capacity to study trends in the past, as you say, and to project them forward 
into the future in ways that slightly increase its chances of survival. It's not just humans that do this. It's not just humans that seem to take advantage of this real room. And that's why it seems to me that the idea of purpose, even though let's, let's concede the word purpose is a sort of placeholder for something we don't fully understand at the moment, but a word like purpose may be a crucial part of defining living organisms. Because as far as we know, rocks don't give a damn whether they are eroded away into sand. The sun won't care when it finally breaks down and dies. But you look at the behavior of an E. coli bacterium, and that is the behavior of something that seems to discriminate between good futures and bad futures. And we, can, we know what the good futures are. The good futures have two qualities. One is I survive a bit longer. The second is my chances of reproducing are increased. Survive, reproduce. Um, that seems to be built into the things that look like purpose in all living organisms. I'm skirting around this using, you know, using kind of cowardly language, but, but I think we have to because most biologists get very twitchy if you talk about purpose. Although Paul Nurse, who I, I quote in the book, um, has no hesitation in saying that purpose is one of the core components, is one of the core elements, or must be a core element of any definition of life. Yeah, definitely. I, I'm, I'm I, stopping I think, myself. Before I I'm, I'm okay with the use of the, the word. I use it all the time, you know, in writing about what's the purpose of life. Well, what's the purpose of a sun? Its purpose is to burn hydrogen into helium. That's what it does, you know, based on the laws of nature. Now, that's pretty simple. So, of course, it doesn't know it has a purpose. Or the purpose of the bacterium is to, say, follow a chemical gradient toward some uh, chemicals that it needs for, for caloric for energy capture. Uh, well, why, does, why is it doing that? Well, because of the second law of thermodynamics and entropy. Everything runs down. So the purpose of life is to capture and sort of carve out a little niche of order in the larger decaying environment. And that's its purpose. And so you can just sort of scale up from there to organisms like the examples you just gave. That's their purpose, to survive and reproduce. And as, as evolutionary theorists often point out, it's, it's not just survival. That's not enough uh, because you can concoct the wrong um, just so stories based on that. It's getting your genes into the next generation. So, you know, people mistakenly think, well, being fit means being fast and camouflaged or whatever. Well, it could be being slow and dumb and small brained and burrowing underground or whatever, to, whatever it takes to get your genes in the next generation. And so it's not just survival. You have to reproduce. OK, so. And, and, and so on. Anyway, so you can, to me, you could scale up from there and then build a purpose, you know, like, as you said uh, in, in, in the book, uh, you know, if you don't clean your room, it turns to clutter. If you don't work out, your body turns flabby. If you don't eat, you know, you become hungry. So the purpose, part of the purpose of life is to push back, clean your room, you know, uh, wash your car, work out, you know, eat quality food and, and on and on. It gets down to some kind of basic self-help stuff that makes sense in that larger context. And, you know, the, the word purpose, you know, I agree with you, it, it's loaded, but I don't know, it's okay. It, 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 people understand what you mean by that, you know, so, and, and the larger point at the end of your book is, well, our purpose is to, so here, let's see how far you want to go with me on this. You know, we, we left Africa and migrated out to all the different areas of the world. That's part of our purpose. You know, species, when, when, they're, when they're not diversified enough, or they're hungry, they need to go out. I mean, rats, for example, become more active when they're hungry because they, they need to get out and, and explore to find more calories and, and mates and so forth. And so is it our destiny to leave the planet and, and colonize Mars and go out to the moons of Jupiter and Saturn and go to Alpha Centauri and and in a and hundred million years, what, what was your calculation? 200 million years, colonize the entire Milky Way galaxy and so on. You know, would you go so far as to say that is built into us? That's what we do. I think um, it's, I, I would want to add something else. Um, I, I've got a very strong hunch, and I argue this in the book, that the idea of purpose is helpful in thinking about living organisms, because it's as if we see them pushing back against the forces that surround them. Whereas 
an inanimate thing like the sun. Its fate is determined by the forces around it. We don't see inanimate objects giving the impression of pushing back. Um, but so, so they're trying to survive. They're trying to reproduce. But there's one other thing, which is um, different organisms do it in different contexts and with different degrees of skill. Now, I have argued for many years that we as a species are very strange, very strange indeed, on, on planetary scales. There has been no species like us for four billion years. And what makes us different is that most species come into the world with a repertoire of tricks. There's a bit of wriggle room. They can, they can expand it slightly and so on. We are unique because some tiny chain has opened a door that has allowed us to, ex to keep learning about new niches. We, we have a capacity to share information and therefore to fulfill this purpose of surviving and reproducing with more and more skill, generation by generation. Now, it's that skill that allows this purpose, which we share with all living organisms, to take on a form that no other living organism, to, to, to operate on a scale that no other living organism could contemplate. Um, so I think that, that, and I call this collective learning, uh, cultural evolution is another phrase for it, uh, whatever you like. Um, so I think that is what makes us so radically different as a species. And when it comes to thinking about the future, it's that we can think about the future in conversation with millions of other people, both people alive and people who died in the past. Um, even very clever animals, dolphins, chimps, um, cannot do that in a way that gives them a history of significant change over many generations. That's the critical difference, I think. Yeah, definitely. Uh, and, and I want to uh, take that in, in a little bit to the next century, thousand years, 10,000 years, and so on. But before that, there's so much interesting material you have early in the book about time. You know, what is it? So I, we already talked about A series and B series time and what that implies. Time is the fourth dimension you know, from Einstein. Um, but then you also have some discussion on the psychology of time and how it passes kind of anthropology of time, different cultures have different concepts of time. So talk about some of that, because I, I found some of that really interesting. Yeah, well, I'm, um, th that discussion of time, I, I loved reading about it. But, but you know, I have the sense that it, it took me into a philosophical jungle where eventually I got lost. <laughs> but then I thought, okay, let's come back to the real life of real organisms where solving the philosophical problems is actually not necessary. What you need is to be able to deal with the uncertainty of time. So, so that's why the second chapter is called Time as a Relationship. And I think, I think Einstein's work actually is a nice metaphor for the idea of, of, of time as a relationship, because he proved what I, Newton didn't understand, that, that, the, that the, the, the qualities of time change depending on who you are, where you are, what is your frame of reference. Um, so, um, oh gosh, now, now Michael, your, your, your question was about, um, well, the I, I've now got, well, got tangled up in my own. Well, I, I actually asked several things, so that was my fault, but because but, I was interested in Einstein and all that. Um, but also, you know, how different cultures have different concepts of time. Yes. And, you know, ours, yes. you know, okay. yeah. Yeah, so this is so the anthropology of time, and this was for me one of the most difficult chapters to write. That chapter in which I try to reconstruct how the most ancient human cultures, in what I, I now like to call the foundational era of human history rather than the Paleolithic, trying to reconstruct how they may, may have thought about the future. Um, the anthropology of time is absolutely fascinating because it begins with a with a what may look at first like an insoluble paradox. All the science tells us that even if we don't fully understand time, it 
is something that does not it, it, it's real. It, it's part of the universe. Or what, whatever, whatever it is we're slapping the label on time on is part of the universe. It's not something that should change from culture to culture. And yet, if anthropologists study how different cultures look at time, they come up with radically different views about how time works. So how do you solve that apparent paradox? Well, I think the best, well, the best solution, I think, is to talk more about how time is experienced. And it's an oversimplification, but my argument is that it may help to think of time as our experience of the rhythm of the world we live in. Now, if you think of the rhythms, and, and to live and to survive, we, like all living organisms, have to fit in to some degree with the rhythms of the world. If you think of three different types of rhythms, and this is a simplification, but it may clarify some of this. The first is natural rhythms. These are day and night, the seasons, the, 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 the rhythms of the stars and the sky and so on. We, we have to live with those. Um, the second is psychological rhythms. And those, are, we all know, are very, very different. Um, in, in, in dreams, you know, your sense of time is really weird. It loops back and forth. It sort of... You know, it, it, it edits out whole sections of time, or if you take drugs. So we know that's a very different experience of time. But then there's a third type, and there's a wonderful German sociologist, not well enough known, Norbert Elias, who wrote a wonderful book on time about this, about social time. Now, social time is the rhythms of time that are shaped by our fellow human. I think in the earliest human societies that were fairly small and whose technologies set limits to how much they could change their surroundings, the natural and psychological rhythms really dominated. So scheduling a meeting with your mum or your dad was, was not that complicated. Um, but dances, the rhythms of dances, the hypnotic rhythms of dances, those were immensely important. And the rhythms of the natural world, you know, when the kangaroos come into season, when's the best time for hunting them? So if you think of Human history as a whole, one of the clearest long-term trends is towards the increasing power of social time. As we find ourselves embedded in larger and larger groups, not groups of 50 people, but groups of a thousand, a million, and today in the world of the internet, we're embedded in a group of almost 8 billion people. We're all locked into this grid. And that means that social time now dominates our sense of time in a way that it didn't in the past. And that explains many, many of these paradoxes about the anthropology of time. It explains, for example, one of the strangers, which is that there's lots of hints that most human societies have thought of the universe as mostly pretty unchanging. Yes, the lives of individuals change. Yes, there are daily changes. There's sickness, there's, there's birth, there's death. But if you think of it, geology in, in, until the 17th century didn't suspect that landscapes changed or that mountains and seas changed. Uh, the idea that the universe had a history is, is only about 60 or 70 years old. The idea that species have a history really began to take off only in the mid-19th century with Darwin. So this fundamental assumption that we live in a, a world of profound change, a world of history, is very modern indeed. Um, and I think that is a measure of the speed with which more and more humans have found themselves caught up in a global world. I mean, even in the 18th century, if you lived in a remote village, and I've done research on well, 19th century Russian village life, um, you could most of the time ignore anything beyond the village. Now it's, now it's unthinkable. Um, so something has happened very, very fast in the last centuries to profoundly change our sense of time. And all of that means that thinking about the future now has a kind of edge that it didn't have in the past. Because if you lived in a world of permanence, then thinking about the future wasn't really that problematic because you could more or less assume that most things were going to be pretty much the way they are today. Yeah. You make this point in uh, one of your lectures. I think it was this book. It might have been the other book. Anyway, it, it's a similar point Dawkins makes that he calls middle world. That is, 
we evolved on the plains of Africa uh, to perceive middling size animals, middling size objects like trees and mountains, maybe from ants to mountains. That's about the range. Uh, and, and, and speed, you know, from the crawling of a turtle to maybe a, a cheetah running at 60 miles an hour, or maybe a lightning bolt, you know, something like that. But the idea of like the speed of light or, you know, quantum effects or a galaxy, an expanding universe, none of this makes any sense at all to our intuitive neuro or, or kind of neural architecture of grasping things in a deep sense. You just can't, right? Uh, yeah, you quoted Gould in, in, in one of your chapters on that, you know, that deep time, you know, he, I could get deep time in terms of like how many zeros I have to put after the one, but do I really grasp what, you know, a billion years means or, uh, you know, a trillion dollars? No, I don't really get it. Uh, and he, he Gould used to like to quote uh, John McPhee in the opening of one of his books, which is that the tip of Mount Everest is marine limestone. You know, you know, 29,000 feet up, it used to be underwater. That, that's just inconceivable. I mean, it's like, I don't even know what you're talking about. What? <laughs> I mean, I, I get it intellectually, but, you know, in a yeah. deep sense. I think that's part of the problem we face. And I think part of your work almost has a religious or spiritual sense to it. Because what is religion for? Part of it is to answer the biggest questions. Where did we come from? What are we doing here? Where are we going? What? When did time begin? When? When's it going to end? What? What happens? You know, later, much later, and you know, science is now trying to answer those questions through fields like big history. But I, I think psychologically, the appeal to it is a little bit like roots writ large. Another uh, uh, Gould analogy. You know that evolutionary theory is roots writ large. We want to know what's my roots. Everybody wants to know that. It's it's a deep feeling and. You know, part of the success of 23andMe as a company is that people want to know their roots, not just what their diseases are or whatever, but, but you know, where, where did I come from? Who are my ancestors? And I was just watching this Netflix documentary this, uh, called Our Father, and this is a, a darker side to the 23andMe, where all these um, people found out that they have half-siblings, you know, dozens and dozens of them, all from this one fertility doctor in Indiana who was using his own sperm rather than the donors that the women thought they were getting. Anyway, it's a terrible. Story. And every one of them that was interviewed was totally shattered, just completely crushed. And of course the, 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 the you know, the, the fathers were like, Oh, so this is not my, wasn't my sperm. It was this other guy. And they are just so upset at, about this. And that, you know, because we want to know what, where did I come from? You know, what's my ancestry? Where are we going? You know, and so, I don't know. I'm just kind of riffing on the, you know, to me, the appeal of, of what you're doing with big history. Yeah, well, can I, can I just riff slightly on that too, which is yeah. I, I'm not, yeah. um, my, my wife says I lack the religious lobe. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, me too. I just, I, um, I think, you know, growing up in Nigeria, and surrounded by, you know, very intelligent Nigerian kids um, who they knew what Christianity was. But for some of them, it was it was just nonsense. Um, I, I, I always I grew up as a kid with a sense that different people worship different gods. And that left me a bit confused uh, about, you know, which God should one really should, was the God of the English Anglican Church whose sermons <laughs> put me to sleep. Really? <laughs> anyway, so for me, I, I think I've always struggled to understand religion, and I, I'm, not, I'm not taking pride in that. It's, 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 a, it's a blank spot. But in this book, one of the things that I think I was forced to recognize is that as a futurist, Nicholas Rescher writes, the future is where we will spend the rest of our lives. Now, that, that <laughs> punchy statement is a reminder that we should get anxious. We should spend a lot of time thinking about the future. So anxiety, not just anxiety, sometimes hope, but strong feelings attached to the future. So the strength of those feelings may help explain why when we think about the future, we often 
overreach. Um, it explains why so many intelligent people actually secretly read the astrology columns. <laughs> Maybe there's something in astrology I don't really know, you know. Um, and 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 for most we have for most of human history, I think the evidence is pretty clear. Most human beings have assumed that we live in a world in which we're surrounded by invisible beings, gods, spirits, ancestral spirits, who can be contacted with difficulty and who may be able to see further into the future than we can. So that's why there's really a whole chapter on, on what we can call divination, um, something that, you know, even in... in, in Roman intellectuals like Cicero took very ser seriously indeed. He wrote a wonderful, wonderful book on, on divination. And, and then the, the fact that we may be neurologically programmed to see active living beings all around us, or not to see, actually, to imagine them all around us. Because um, if you look out the corner of your eye, and you see something move in the stream nearby. It could just be some, a log floating past, or it could be a crocodile. Now, for natural selection, it makes sense to program you to take the crocodile hypothesis more seriously than the log hypothesis, because it's better to be overcautious than undercautious. And if that's true, there's now a whole body of literature that argues that this very strong feeling that I, I feel less than a lot of people, but that so many people have, that there is a spirit world all around us, may have a kind of neurological basis. Um, I, 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 I think that argument is, is interesting, and I, I find it very, very plausible indeed. And that's why so much future thinking really was thinking about if the gods can see further into the future than I can, how can I contact the gods and get them <laughs> to give me a clue about what's going on? Right. And I was forced to yes. take, and I think you know, one of the things about modern, modern science and modern scientific future thinking is that um, I now find, find myself taking very seriously the hypothesis that one of the distinctive features of modern science is that it rejects the hypothesis that we are surrounded by uh, active beings who can shape our lives. Mm. And it tries to see if you can explain the world without that hypothesis. Um, so that modern future yeah. thinking, which is that much more successful than the future thinking in the past, is, is, is rejects that hypothesis. Hmm. At least modern course, scientific, right? Things. The naturalism assumption has to be there because the word supernatural or paranormal, point I always make, th these are just linguistic placeholders to try to explain something that we can't explain otherwise. And science is getting better and better at explaining those previously unexplained phenomena. Now, I did work out the kind of the logic of what I call patternicity, the tendency to find meaningful patterns in random noise and what I call agenticity, the tendency to infuse those patterns with agency, these hidden forces. And, and it's a type one versus type two kind of error. You hear a rustle in the grass, is it a dangerous predator or just the wind, your crocodile or log? Well, it, you know, natural selection is going to nudge organisms to assume the worst just in case, because if it turns out it's just the wind or just the log, that's a low cost error. It doesn't cost much to make that mistake, but the, but the contrary to that then can be expensive. So it's not that we assume everything is supernatural or gods or ghosts or angels or aliens or, and demons and so on, but, but th there's a base, there's a kind of logic to it. In other words, the problem of why people believe these things is not that they lack uh, intelligence or education or anything. It's just, it's built into the system. You know, it's, it's, it's a feature, not a bug. And uh, I've been exploring this for my next book comes out in the fall on conspiracy theories. One reason for conspiracy, people believe conspiracy theories is because enough of them are true. There are conspiracies. People do conspire to harm other people or gain an unfair advantage. Government agencies, corporations, 
um, you know, the mafia groups, all kind, you know, just any kind of coalitions of humans plotting against other humans. That happens all the time, and it did happen in our past. So I'm arguing there's an evolutionary origin to conspiracism that you know it pays to to be a little suspicious and a little paranoid because <laughs> other other groups can be dangerous. Jared Diamond makes this point all the time about his experiences in Papua New Guinea, you know, uh, where he, when he was doing his birding, then he's doing his biogeography and so on. He would uh, he tells a story about hiking down a little single track trail with his guide and it, who was his friend, and they encountered some stranger. And Jared's like, "Oh, let's go up and let, let's go meet this guy and talk to him. This will be really interesting." And his guide is like, "Are you out of your mind? This guy could kill us. He made there may be other people. We don't do that here." We are paranoid. So Jared calls that constructive paranoia. <laughs> anyway, I'm just kind of riffing a little bit on that uh, that point you made. Uh, but let's go back to uh, just just for a minute on, on the concept of time. Um, you know, because Buddhists and modern kind of Western Buddhists and people that promote med- meditation, one of their points is that you have to live in the now to a certain extent. It, you know, so let's talk about what the now is in just a second. But because the past has already happened, you can't change it. The future hasn't happened yet. Um, and so uh, one of the problems of modern society is people kind of have this thought flooding, they call it, of just kind of constantly going over the past. You know, I should have said that, and that guy said this, and that really pisses me off, and I wish this would have happened, and I'm just going to dwell on this for hours and hours and hours, complete waste of time, pumps up your stress hormones. So the whole point of meditation is to get out of that. You know, so I like that idea, but it's hard to live in the now, because how long is that? Three seconds or something, Right. And I gotta plot the future because I have to make my uh, house payment next month. So <laughs> I gotta think about what I'm gonna do, right? I can't just constantly live in the now. Anyway, so talk about what what is what is now and the past, the future, and you know, to what extent can we look forward a little bit that we should be looking forward a little bit? Yeah, I, I mean that getting caught. We've talked about anxiety about the future, and I think that's a profound driver of a lot of a, a lot of our thinking. And in fact, I, I flirted with the idea in this book that it may be if you watch your own thinking or just look at a newspaper and ask how much of that newspaper is actually about the future, you find a colossal amount is oh. about the future. So we spend a huge amount of time thinking about the future and about the past. Um, the trouble is that. You And I think this is the Buddhist insight. We only exist in the present. We don't actually exist in any real sense in the future or past. We exist in our imagination. So if you spend too much time thinking about the past and the future, you may miss crucial things that are happening right now. Every athlete knows this. Every, every Any activity... Hunting on the African savanna lands requires a, a very sharp focus on what is going on right in front of you. So um, we live in a world uh, that is perhaps less, or certainly middle class modern people live in a world in which there are, for the most part, except in heavy traffic, less immediate physical dangers. So maybe the temptation to drift into the past and the future is greater than it was in the past. And so we have to learn skills that I think in the past maybe didn't have to be, didn't have to be learned systematically. So it's to me no surprise that in the Indian traditions, these meditative traditions kick in at a period in Indian history, first millennium BC, when there's rapid urbanization. Suddenly, people are beginning to live in much larger human communities. Um, So living in the present becomes a skill that's not intuitive, that's not instilled by your life way, but one you actually have to work at. And and I think that's that's very true in the modern modern world, um, that, that, that we have to work at it. Having said that, if you live in this vast grid of 8 billion people, um, then, you know, immediate, what's happening in immediately in front of me. Um, now, if, if a bus is just about to run me down, then that's important. But, but much of the time, actually, we do need to spend more time thinking about the future and the past than we, than we did in, in earlier epochs of human history. We really do need to think about climate change. 
Um, I have a, I, I've lived for the last year with a baby granddaughter who is, mm. I have to tell you, Michael, the most scrumptious being <laughs> on earth. And I spend a lot of time worrying about her future. You know, yeah. she say, what the hell was grandpa doing? And, and thank <laughs> God, by the way, um, Australia has just had an election. Um, and, right. and we now have a government that may actually begin to take climate change seriously. Yeah. Thank God. Good. Yeah, I saw I, I'm drifting uh, now. <laughs> yeah, no, no, that's all right. Yeah. Now, I was thinking about this the other day because, um, as you know, the stock market has taken a massive hit the last two months. And so in, in, in order to keep myself from, from uh, you know, feeling really bad about my 401k retirement account, because I'm, I'm, I'm about to turn 68, so I'm starting to think about those things. Uh, I have to, I, I, I go back two years to see where I was two years ago, and I'm ahead of where I was two years ago when I was super happy. <laughs> about how everything was going in the stock market. And then I look at the long-term trends like, oh yeah, well, I remember three years ago, the, the market dipped this much in 2008, it dipped you know 10 times worse than it has in the last two months and it recovers. So calm down, the future's gonna be okay based on the past. That's a kind of futurism that you're talking about using data to make these projections, right? So in the new book, you kind of dove into the world of futurism you know, futurists, people that do this, which I find fascinating. But, you know, then I was recalling um, Philip Tetlock's research on forecasting and how bad most public forecasters are. You know, like, you know, if we would have said in December, do you think Putin is going to invade Ukraine all out? You know, and everybody said, oh, no, no, he's not going to do that. He just wants that Donbass region. He's just going to nip off like he did with uh, Crimea. Then he'll withdraw the troops. And that's not what happened. Almost nobody correctly predicted that, right? So, you know, why are forecasters so bad? What is your opinion of forecasters and, and people that predict the future? And, you know, what can we do in, in future forecasting that is rational and reasonable and, and to keep us from, you know, going off some tangent? Well, Nate Silver has a wonderful book on forecasting in which he's really tough on economists in particular. Um in my book, one of the things I realized is, um, despite my inherent skepticism about divination, a hell of a lot of ancient diviners often did a pretty good job of predicting. Mm. Now, eventually I was forced to realize that I can't, I shouldn't try to explain this by accepting their assumption that they actually had a kind of, you know, hotline to the gods. It was actually something different. They were in the business of making money. They were in the business of satisfying the anxieties of people who wanted predictions, but they also wanted to be recommended. So they wanted people to recommend them as, as, as forecasters who occasionally got it right. Now that means they, many of them actually just thought carefully with common sense and sometimes with a sort of statistical intuition, intuition about about the most likely forecasts in a given situation. So they were not stupid. Um, and, and that's why a lot of ancient diviners um, probably did, I suspect, almost as well as most economic forecasters today. Now, there are domains in which we can forecast with a precision that was unthinkable in the past. Uh, astronomy is one. Um, I, you know, a good astronomer will, will, will tell me exactly when the next lunar eclipse will happen. Um, medicine is another, you know, the course of medical diseases. So I think the, um, the, 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 the crucial thing that I learned from all of this, and I was amazed I'd never heard this said before, is something I've, I've already said. You have to think of the whole domain of reality, the many processes that surround us and that will shape our future. And you have to discriminate between domains. This is why I have these future cones between different types of domains. And there are the very regular domains. Now, if you want to talk about the future, you, you have to start with those domains where prediction is worthwhile. Now, climate change happens to be one of, one of them now. The science is good enough. It's not absolute, but... We know we've been pumping greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. We can measure the amount. 
We know the temperatures are going up. We know the biochemistry that explains why more greenhouse gases bump up the temperature. We know why we're burning such fossil fuels. All, all this is, is very clear. So this is a fairly regular process. But at the other extreme, there are less regular processes. And, and one of the, again, it's a very simple revelation, but to me was that if you're in a domain where the process is going to be shaped by the decisions of human beings, you are in a less predictable domain. Now, that may explain why meteorology um, is, in many ways, meteorologists offer more precise, more careful, more cautious predictions, by and large, than economists, um, because they're dealing with a domain where there are incredibly complex um, physical processes going on, but, uh, but you don't have the kind of random element of, of someone taking it into their head to do something perverse. Um, so this means that when we think about climate change, for example, we can be very clear about the science. If we pump this much, if we burn these fossil fuels, we almost certainly we will get this, you know, that the climates will warm by this amount. But if you start asking questions about how likely is it that we will do the things needed to get to one point to stay below 1.5 degrees of warming above the pre-industrial era, that is in a different domain because it's a domain in which human actions are involved. Ditto for most. This is why economic prediction is so so tricky. People desperately want economic predictions, so they pay forecasters a lot. So they encourage economic forecasters to talk with confidence because sometimes the confidence affects the prediction the, the prediction um but it's it's a domain where predictions are unreliable and being much more precise about what sort of domain we're predicting in is i think the real key it it will never guarantee perfect predictions but it it may sensitize you more to the sort of error bands you're involved in, and, and in so many areas. I, I give an example such as predicting inflation rates for the Bank of England. After mm. three or four years, the error bands are so wide that, that what you say is completely insignificant. It's, it's not worth saying anything. You know? um, so this in, sensitivity in that, just, to the regularity for... of different domains is, I think, yeah. Yeah, I've heard that figure, like three to five years out, no one can predict political, economic, social futures uh, better than chance. Well, again, you'd have to be more, you'd, you'd have to discriminate carefully. Again, Nate, Nate Silver, and I think I quote him on this, um, says that if you're a political pollster, and he has, I think, spent some time predicting elections, he says everyone who's in that business knows that different types of American elections have different degrees of predictability. So, so this operates not just at a gross scale, it operates at a very fine scale. Um, I think, you know, anyone who bets on the horses, which, which, which I don't do, I don't understand it, but, but uh, they know that, you know, different types of tracks um, allow different degrees of confidence in, in the odds for different horses. So, so discriminating how much, what sort of predictions are plausible in this context uh, is, I think, one of the keys to, to both decent prediction and to knowing when you should bail out and you should not even try to predict. Oh, sorry, one final point, Michael, which is <laughs> this explains, I think, why there are so many domains in which modern prediction is no better than prediction 2,000 years ago, particularly in the domains that involve human action. But there are domains where prediction is vastly better um, than it was in the past. And those are domains where things are more regular and where the mathematics of probability can actually really narrow the error bands for our predictions a bit.
Yeah, it's like the recent uh, news stories on the price of gas just the last two months has gone way up, uh, even here, in the, especially here in the United States. Uh, and, you know, they often treat it like it's a mystery, you know, so they'll get different economists on to explain supply and demand and this and that and politicians. It's like, why don't you ask the guy that walks out <laughs> at the gas station and raises the price by a buck? Why did he do that? Well, somebody told him to do that. Okay, who told him to do that and why? At some point, you're going to end up at some guy at uh, Exxon Mobil or Chevron that said, yeah, we're raising the prices because we can <laughs> or something along those lines. It's got to be at some level a human decision, right? Uh, okay, so uh, one of Tetlock's uh, points about the, his super forecasters, his book is called Super Forecasters, is that the, the few that are better than random are Bayesian in their thinking. They they put probabilities and statistical numbers on different things and outcomes. It's never almost never binary, never black and white. For sure, this is going to happen. No, no, there's like a 67% chance that uh, Putin will invade Ukraine. Or, you know, it's just like in the 2016 election. How could Trump have won? Because, you know, there was a... Uh, you know, 70% chance that Hillary was going to win. Well, this was one of the 30, right? If you ran that election 100 times, Trump wins 30 of them. And this is one of the 30, right? People have a hard time getting that, grasping that, like, you know, the 50% chance hey, of rain Michael, this weekend. Yeah. If if you say, let's run the we like the weather, I get weather forecasts that say there's a 20% chance of rain. What's that really saying? Well, it's saying that a huge computer somewhere has run the possibilities um, thousands of times and 20% of them came up with, with rain. That takes us back to those future cones we were looking at. Those thousands of runs on the computer, that is, that is the widening, that's the future cone there. And then eventually only one appears in the present. Right. That's right. Well, this is the one. You okay, can't run the election a hundred times. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, in fact, I, I tried doing this. Um, one of my other little uh, wheelhouse topics is UFOs and UAPs and extraterrestrial intelligence and all that. And, you know, there's been much talk about these Navy videos of these unidentified aerial phenomena. UAP is a sexier title than UFOs, which carries a lot of baggage to it. Anyway. Um, so I follow these these people on Twitter that are just certain, absolutely, you know, disclosure by the federal government. They're going to release the knowledge that we have made contact with aliens. It's coming for sure this year, if not next year. Right. So last week I posted a, a challenge. OK, like the betting markets, right, the future markets where you put money up on elections and things like that. And those are pretty good. Uh, right. I said, all right, how about, you know, we'll put I'll put up a thousand. You put up a thousand bucks. Uh, and, and we'll just say by December 31st, 2023, uh, contact will not have been made. And if it has been, you know, we just said, agree on some criteria. You know, the federal, you know, the Pentagon comes out and says, yes, we have the spacecraft. Here it is. Everybody could see it. The Joint Chiefs of Staff hold a meeting and go, yep, we've been contacted. You know, it turns out it was this and so on. And then so there's no doubt you get my thousand bucks. Right. No one will touch it. They're not interested in that. <laughs> they don't want to put up any money. Right. Yeah. So I think when you with the, the one of the reasons the betting markets work uh, is that people, if they have skin in the game, then they have to become more Bayesian and careful about those error bars and, and putting estimates. Yeah. 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 Uh, yes. OK, let's talk I, about I mean, I, I'm let's just talk about, Yeah, yeah. So uh, let's talk about your kind of the several chapters in the book, like the next hundred years, the next thousand years, the next 10,000 years. And so how do you think about like, let's just take the next decade or the, to the next century, the 2100, not just climate change, but other uh, forecasted changes you see that could go either good or bad? Well, if um, in in my, my second chapter, I, I took the risk of... Um, trying to formulate some very, very basic principles for thinking about the future. Um, one of them that's written into science is that if you understand the causes of things, um, you've got a better chance of, of understanding how they turn out. I mean, this, this goes back to Newton's laws of motion. If you understand the causes that shape the trajectory of a cannonball, you can shape it much better. Now, artillery engineers are very interested in things like that. But the second is trends. Um, we have no evidence from the future. We have to keep reminding ourselves. We get have no documents, no evidence from the future. 
So this is why it's it's a very perverse operation. We think about the future by looking backwards. And that's why I love uh, the preface to the book is a picture of the soothsayers with their heads mm. twisted back from I Dante's Inferno. Yeah, yeah. So we're always looking at trends. Now, if, if this is correct, and I, I think it is, um, the only evidence we have about the future is past trends combined with a hunch, and it's no more than a hunch, that some of them look powerful enough that we expect them to continue. And even the weaker ones, we can probably roughly see where they're going. Then the basic rule for thinking about the future is simply to study the past trends. Um, so any scenarios for the future should begin with looking at past trends. Um, and if you're looking at a remote future, then what you ought to be looking at is something that I think historians struggle to do because they mostly don't do history at large scales, very large trends in human history. Now, this takes me back to things like uh, collective learning. If I've got this right, and I have to qualify that, but if I've got it right, then we can say that one of the defining features of our species, species is collective learning, this capacity to share information. Now, if that's true, then, and the whole of human history is shaped by our ability to share and accumulate information about our surroundings, and information allows you to control your surroundings, then we expect that to continue in the future. That's one of the most powerful trends we can see in human history. We expect science to continue into the future. Um, but um, there are other trends like uh, globalization. In the past, humans, for most of human history, consisted of huge numbers of communities between which there were very limited links. In the last hundred years, we have become globally interlocked so that a war in Ukraine uh, affects when I, in Australia, affects the petrol prices in, in, in Australia. Um, so we are now a global species. As far as we know, the first global species in the planet's history. And we are so powerful that what we do will shape the future of the planet. Now, that, that trend points to another rather strange predic prediction that is embedded in all the literature on the idea of the Anthropocene Epoch. We are becoming planetary managers, and planet Earth is becoming... Now, this may sound like kind of overdramatic or poetic language, but planet Earth is becoming a conscious planet. It's conscious in the sense that our bodies are conscious. That is to say, most of the decisions in our bodies are taken cell by cell, not after careful thought. But the huge executive decisions that will shape our future are taken after conscious thought. Now we suddenly find ourselves at a phase in human history and planetary history that is transformative. It's a phase in which con the conscious thinking of lots of humans will shape the future of planet Earth. It will shape the climate system. It will shape the ocean system. It will shape levels of biodiversity. Um, it could lead to catastrophe if we release nuclear weapons on a large scale. So we're at this, so there's a prediction based on past trends, very powerful past trends. It's a very powerful one and it's a very strange one. It's that we are becoming planetary managers. We are still carrying L plates. So this is a very dangerous time. Um, a driver with L plates or with I, I, what, what are the plates in the States? Are they called L plates and P plates? No, what but is that? The P plates plate. here. Are the, what is that? Okay, the learner, the learner driver. The P oh, plates oh, are the driver yeah. who's just got their license, but not much I experience. See. I see. So we are learner drivers. Now that yeah. makes us pretty dangerous to ourselves yeah. and others. But our job is to learn as quickly as possible how to manage a planet. Once we've done it, now I think there are other predictions we can make. And you talked about migration. We, because of collective learning, we keep learning about new niches, new domains. Now we're at the very first stages of learning about domains off planet. 
on Mars, on the moon. Um, so there's another very powerful prediction that our past of migrations, which was driven, I believe, by our capacity to learn about unfamiliar environments, will continue. Um, although there's another prediction we can make, which is that we've reached planetary limits. This is what the limits to growth. So there are areas in which we will have to cut back our consumption and control our behavior. But there are areas in which this pattern of migration will continue. So I, I don't want to go on, but, but, but in the near future, studying trends carefully um, can... It should be the basis of the scenarios we predict, the good ones and the bad ones. And the bad ones, of course, are based on the fact that we have facts like we have built nuclear weapons. We are so powerful. We have built weapons that, in principle, if unleashed, could destroy much of the biosphere in 24 hours. They exist, and we have used those weapons in war. So far, on a very limited scale. Um, so, so, yeah, that, 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 yeah that's so, enough. But, so, but, but all so, the final yeah. I think, are based on things like that. So one answer to the Fermi paradox, where is everybody, is that perhaps technologically advanced civilizations get to the point where we are and they just collapse. <laughs> and, uh, you know, yeah. maybe. that That's kind of the pessimistic view of the future Hopefully, even the fact that we can realize that and even think about it, like, hey, maybe that's an answer. Maybe we'll be, we won't be like the, the, the guy on Easter Island that chops down the last tree and says, oh, the hell with it. <laughs> I'll just cut it down. What's, what's the future? We can project the future and go, nope, you know, we're not going to do that. You know, when, when there's a hundred trees left, we're, we're going to stop, right? Something like that. I, I want to make a point from my, my friend and colleague, David Barish, the biologist, um, he and I debated about this, you know, it's our destiny to go to Mars and colonize the galaxy and so on. And uh, his point is, you know, just because we do something, we migrate out of Africa and spread all over the earth doesn't mean we should do it because look what we've done to this planet. It's not all good. And shouldn't we be concentrating on maintaining a sustainable planet rather than leaving the planet? I don't know. It's a, it's an interesting debate. What are your thoughts on that? Uh, look, I, I agree with him completely. Uh, but we were talking about predictions. I, my, I think if you look at the past, assuming we get through the bottleneck, um, we don't destroy ourselves, which we must count as one possible scenario. Assuming we get through the bottleneck, uh, I think, look, I, th I think we are going to be spreading to other planets and we're going to be spreading beyond the planet. And in a strange sense, what we will be looking at is the way that conscious planets reproduce. Does that, does that make sense? Mm, so if maybe. conscious planets are a new type of entity, at least we don't know of their existence elsewhere, now we're looking at how they reproduce. They reproduce by sending out spores, I suppose, I, to other, other planets. Oh, that's super um, interesting. So, right. But I agree also. I, I'm also an optimist about um, sustainability on this planet. And, and there are several reasons for, for optimism. One is watching the profound shift in attitudes and views in my own lifetime. Now, you can look at the terrifying curves of the increase in greenhouse gas emissions. It's harder to graph shifts in people's understanding of greenhouse gases. When the first Limits to Growth book came out in 1972, wonderful book, by the way. I went back and reread it. Absolutely wonderful. And it got so much right with what now look like very primitive models. Um, they, um, since then, oh, no one took it seriously. But since then, now, um, every government in the world understands that this has to be taken reasonably seriously, even though there are still people who, who, who you know, who, who balk at that. Um, so our attitudes have changed. A second reason for doing this is simply a tactical one, that um, optimism is itself, is itself a, an instrument for building a better future. The, the, the third is that I think well, this is, this is not so much a grounds for optimism as a, as a kind of exhortation. 
we need to do what some people are already doing, which is spend more time imagining good futures. Dystopian futures, in a sense, are more fun to imagine. They're easier to make films about. Um, but imagining good futures, they won't, they won't be perfect, but there'll be futures in which my gorgeous granddaughter, Sophia, can have a reasonably good life, and even her grandchildren will have a reasonably good life. Um, and there are all sorts of reasons for um, many of the technologies are already available. It's back to the politics, the one thing we really find hard to predict. What will people actually do? And what will people in power actually do? Mm -hmm. Right. I like the word protopia. I'm just, uh, in my book, uh, The Moral Arc, I, I, coin, I, I use Kevin Kelly's concept. Uh, instead of utopia or dystopia, he uses the word protopia. Yeah, you know, Ke Kevin Kelly's the futurist. He he founded Wired magazine, and he's I think he works for Google now. Oh, anyway, he's kind of a futurist. I call myself a protopian, not a utopian. I believe in progress in an incremental way, where every year it's better than the year before, but not by very much, just a micro amount. Close quote. Then I write: instead of the 1950s, imagine jump from the jalopy to the flying car. Think of the decades-long cumulative improvements that led to today's smart cars with their onboard, onboard computers and navigation systems, airbags and composite metal frames and bodies, satellite radios and hands-free phones, electric and hybrid engines. Instead of the great leap forward, think of small step upward. So I like that concept. Just, you know, just one day at a time, just a little bit better. In terms of the limits of growth and the future of the environment. I don't see how we have a future without nuclear power in the equation, but you know, I'll get your thoughts on that. And, and also, instead of limiting the consumption of resources or how much energy any, anybody could use, and I should point out that it's hardly fair for the Western world to say, uh, you know, we've had our industrial revolution, but you don't get one because of CO2 gases. <laughs> How about instead we go forward with new technologies like these new nuclear uh, powers, uh, nuclear power um, uh, technologies that are much better. We're never going to have another Chernobyl again. We're, that, we're not going to let that happen again or Three Mile Island or, or um, uh, Fukushima, right? So um, I don't see how you could do it without that. Instead of worrying about limits to growth, how about we just find new technologies? As, as they say, we didn't leave the Stone Age because we ran out of stones. And, you know, economists make the point we're never going to run out of oil or fossil fuels because the, the price will just go get so high at some point, we'll just stop using it. It's not worth it. And we'll find some new source of energy, right? So, um, you know, anyway, just so what are your thoughts on all that? Well, it's, um, look, there, there, are, there, are, there, are, there are many forms of growth. And when you talk about limits to growth, I think probably you need to add the rider limits to, to growth of the wrong sort. Oh, so right. growth in greenhouse gas emissions needs to be limited. I also suspect, and this is probably more contentious, that, um, that we, we live in a consumerist world where um, measures like GDP presume that more material consumption is the path to happiness. Now, I think most economists understand that if it, if it points to happiness, it's a pretty crude um, directive. Um, and that um, reining in some forms of consumerism uh, might be good for our health, for example, um, but um, might, might be good for a better future. So a future in which, in which people um, do not define the good life primarily by material growth, I think maybe I think that may be a profound moral and ethical shift that we're going to have to face. And one of the reasons for saying that is living in Australia, where you're forced to take very seriously the realities of what I call the foundational era world. We know that for at least 60,000 years, people have lived here. We know also, I think anthropologists now are increasingly agreed that the idea of, of, of that people lived kind of Hobbesian, Hobbesian lives in that era is, well, at least oversimple. 
Um, certainly their life expectancy was less. They had less medical care. All of that's true. But it's also clear that there were many um, positive things, that you could live a very good life like that. And everything we know about lives in a world in which things were thought of as much more permanent, as unchanging, suggests that the task of living well was to live within constraints. Now, it's, it's as if we've lost sight, I think, in our world of the need to be clear about the constraints. And I, that, for me, is the message of limits, limits to growth. I can see areas where I see no limits to growth. Um, growth in knowledge, growth in science. Um, and, and, and I can see, well, well I think I, I, in Origin Story, uh, my, my previous book, I quote um, John Stuart Mill saying, um, talking with great approval about what he called, I think, no, it wasn't a static world. It was a, an equi something like an equilibrium world, a world in which you do not guarantee that your grandchildren will have more material wealth than, than you, um, and in which there's less, less sort of the, the desperate fighting for material goodies than we see today. So I do think we're going to need a shift away from the more extreme forms of consumerism that shape the world today for the simple reason that consumerism is not the same as happiness. And there's now a large literature, as you know, uh, on that. Yeah, I've been talking to some guests about that and reading about that. You know, there was that study that found, I don't know, like 20 years ago that, you know, once you make about $75,000 a year making more money after that doesn't increase happiness. Well, that's not true, actually. And of course, you'd have to adjust up for inflation and so on. But 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 you have to make more and more money to get um it, it's not a it's not a straight curve. It's a whatever kind of curve that is, an exponential curve. Whatever. You have to make way more money to you can keep increasing your happiness. But to me, that's the wrong metric. I've been railing about this for a long time now, you know, because Dan Gilbert, the the Harvard psychologist, who wrote that wonderful book, Stumbling on Happiness. He's one of the great researchers on this subject. But he published a study showing that uh, that having children doesn't make people parent or cut couples or or, or 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 people any happier in fact it makes them less happy and it's like that's the wrong metric you don't have kids so that you can feel i don't know constantly happy walking around in a state of euphoria or whatever that word happiness means i mean it's the most purposeful meaningful thing i've ever done you can take everything i've ever done in my several careers and add them all up and then and, and then square that number and it wouldn't be 10 percent of the value that I've got gained in my, not happiness, but just a meaningful life. And now you, I'm sure you feel the same way with your granddaughter. You know, it, it, happiness is the wrong word. It's that, that's not the goal. That's back to purpose. That's not the purpose of life. It's, it's to lead a purposeful, meaningful life. You know, a reason to get up out of bed in the morning, go out, not to make money. Money's good because it gets you more opportunity. You know, maybe just from the, from the lower level, the floor up to, so you have food and a house and, and, and quality education for your kids and gas in the car and things like that. After that, it, it, the additional money does help because it, it maybe you want to start a, a nonprofit foundation and you want to work on big history or, or help the environment or whatever. It takes money to do that, right? So it's just more opportunities. And so I admire people like uh, Buffett and Gates that are just, they're just going to spend it all to try to solve social problems. What's wrong with that? Nothing. You know, so that that's good. Um, but, but if that's the goal, I just want more money in, in some consumerist way because I want a house bigger than my neighbor's house. Well, you, you know, you've gone down the wrong path of what's valuable in life. No, look, I, 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 I take the point and I agree with you hundred percent. Happiness is not, is not the best word to describe the goal, but so let's rephrase this and say, um, that. Modern societies, because they've been so successful at expanding material wealth, they've been very good and at, at doing that. And a lot of increases in well, that, what, what are we going to call it? Well-being have been associated with that. Yeah, well, um, it's all That's too better. easy for modern societies to, to, as it were, think of well-being, happiness, contentment, a sense of purpose as 
tied more closely to growth than I think it really is. There are vast areas of our lives where the sense of purpose, the sense of fulfillment um, is, is, does not depend on more wealth. But there's the other side of this, which is the ethical side, which is um, we live in a world in which material wealth is available to um, huge numbers of people. We have enough wealth, we have enough knowledge to make a basic subsistence level available to everyone, and we're not doing it. If we look towards a better future, there are so many reasons why the issue of uh, inequality should be taken more seriously. And that probably means a politics that takes seriously some forms of redistribution. Um, but, um, because if, if we're talking about a better world, uh, I think most people could surely agree without any problem that uh, a, a world in which millions are still living lives of starvation, in which, which you know, that I saw a hundred million people have been dis displaced by wars recently. We have all the skills, we have all the technologies to feed these people, to give them decent education, to give them all the basics of life, and we're not doing it. So, so um, I, I, I guess what I'm really saying is that I think. Um, the consumerist ethic has really got way out of balance. And the idea of limits growth is capturing for me not a sort of sense of a puritanical or ascetic future, but really a sense that we need to be more discriminating about what we mean by a good future. Um, I think we, we need more debate about what a good society will look like. It's the sort of debate that was very fashionable in the 18th, 19th centuries amongst intellectuals. I, I think we need, need much more of that. And the idea that the economy is a kind of demiurge, uh, and if we feed the economy, whatever the hell the economy is, uh, enough <laughs> goodies, then everything will be right. We, we need to get rid of that one. Yes, well, a lot of conservatives here in the United States kind of look at Northern European countries as if, as if they're socialist, almost communist, which is the exact opposite. In fact, they're very pro-free market and capitalism. That's how they generated so much wealth that they can take care of the people at the bottom. They really have extensive social safety nets, uh, you know, daycare and, and uh, maternity leave and universal health care. And, and uh, you know, somehow they do it. Uh, you know, with like in Germany, where my wife's from, you know, they have a, a you know a, a very strong economy, strongest in the entire EU, and yet they still take care of their citizens much better than we do here in the United States. So let's talk about politics, since you brought that up. Um, you know, at the end of the moral arc, I speculated sort of protopian politics. Uh, you know, the, the idea of nationalism to me is just almost as bad as religion in terms of divisiveness. Um, and, you know, wouldn't it be great if we return to the city state rather than the nation state? Because the nation state's a fairly new concept, just a few centuries old, right? Uh, but then since I wrote that in 2015, there's been a rise of nationalism and authoritarianism. So I was completely wrong that that was the direction, right? But maybe it's a good goal. It seems like a good goal. You know, if there was, you know, the Moscow city state and there was like 50 city states in between Moscow and, and, and Kiev, you know, we wouldn't be seeing any of this stuff going on now, right? It's this nationalism. But I don't have, I, uh, how do you think about the future of like nation states and politics and borders and things like that? Thinking about the Peloponnesian Wars, I'm a bit skeptical about city states as, uh, <laughs> oh, yes. well, as the way to go. Point. The Peloponnesian <laughs> Wars were horrible. Oh, yes. Right. That's really horrible. Um, I, I I'm actually, I think you, you mentioned the idea of moral progress. Now, it's not a, it's not a phrase that really we see, we see being thrown around a lot in political debate these days. It's one Condorcet talked about in the 18th century, you know, one of the great believers in progress. Um, the idea of moral progress. And actually, I think if you look for trends in the past, I think you can see a what I think of as a positive trend in moral progress. So if you go back over two or three centuries, three centuries ago, 
we lived in a world where the idea of slavery was regarded as normal. I mean, many people may not have liked it, but it was just the way life was. Where uh, the idea that the idea of giving women the vote was just just a kind of extravagance. Um, where corporal punishment, um, executions using torture, were widespread. They were regarded as public spectacles. In the 19th century, um, a lot of this shifted. So we now live in a world where it is... Now, there's a lot of slavery in today's world, but it is regarded by in principle, or by every government in the world, and by most people, as a bad thing, as, as a, something intolerable, where the idea of gender equality um, is respected globally in principle, not always in practice, and in one or two cases, um, not always. But, but morally, we live in a very different world. And I think there's a, there's a good reason for that. It's partly, I, I talk about this in the book. Now, the way that single-celled organisms became multi-celled organisms. If you, if you, about, I don't know, a billion years ago, we start seeing the first living organisms that begin to look like multi-celled organisms. To, to form a multi-celled organism, you have to, the individual cells have all the equipment needed to survive. But now you need to give them new equipment. And the new equipment is equipment that allows them to communicate with other cells, to find out what they need to do to collaborate with those cells, to share common problems. And you can see that genetically. Um, multi Eukaryotes, multi-celled organisms, have a whole series of genetic machinery that is designed to help them to collaborate with others. Now, with us, this is all happening culturally, not genetically. But as we become a global species, I think we are becoming actually quite rapidly more and more aware of global interdependence. Now, if you read the press day by day, it may be this may seem pretty implausible. But if you think about history on the scale of a century or two or three centuries, which which is now my normal way of thinking about history, um, the thought that a billionaire in uh, in the States, would travel around the world funding polio clinics in Africa, in Pakistan, and so on, is, 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 is astonishing, quite astonishing. Um, the thought that most countries of the world actually spend a small portion of their budget on making money available to other countries. Now, I know they cheat um, in many ways, but nevertheless, that is remarkable. And, and it's not, it's not a sort of ethical revolution. It's a realistic revolution. It's what happened to those single cells. In multicelled organisms, the single cell cannot survive unless the organism, larger organism, survives. So they have to develop a sensitivity to the needs of the larger organism. Now, I think something like that is happening very quickly in today's world, very rapidly. Um, now, there's no guarantees. We've talked about the fact that the future is really not predictable. There's no guarantees that we'll get it right. Um, but the, the trend, I think, is a very, very powerful one. And it's a trend towards something that we can optimistically think of as a sort of moral progress, a sense that we're all in this together. Um, yeah. Does that make absolutely. sense? Absolutely. Oh, yeah. That's what, well, that's what the, the, my book, The Moral Arc, is about. Uh, that there's an arc to the moral universe that Dr. King predicted, and it is bending toward justice. Or you could, I, I, I prefer the metaphor, uh, uh, expanding moral sphere, but I get this from Peter Singer, moral circle, expanding moral circle, um, which built on his uh, animal rights uh, previous book. And, um, and just the concept of treating somebody as an honorary member of your own tribe, we know we're tribal. We know we're naturally xenophobic for those reasons we talked about before, right? There's a cost-benefit calculation you have to make about strangers, and it's probably better to, to be leery of strangers than not, to be z slightly on the xenophobic side. Uh, but but those are there's workarounds for that, right? Just exposure to those people, all right? Just 
you know, as Jared Diamond talks about, you know, if you sit down and talk to this other person and you figure out some some common knowledge, like, oh, we we both know this other person. Oh, okay, I don't have to kill you. Oh, that's good, right? So something along th- th- those lines. So literacy, expo- you know, travel, television, the internet, and all that, just exposure to other people, you know, can help do that, um, make that person seem human, right? And then now, of course, the animal rights people want to do that for primates and cetaceans and, you know, just keep expanding the moral sphere. And, you know, Peter Singer starts with Jeremy Bentham's quote, you know, it's not, can they think or can they talk? It's, can they feel or suffer? He said, suffer, can they suffer? Right? So our moral starting point is the individual suffering uh, of sentient beings that we want to attenuate. And then you just start from there and you start building from there. So when I talk, so that your your example of the Peloponnesian Wars is a good one. Yes, okay, good point. Uh, but my idea is to you know just break break down those borders that we have somehow uh, enable people to interact with each other so they can see through trade through travel, you know these political borders that we have are very divisive. You know, it's them and us and you know Trump and you know they're bringing their rapists and their and the. And they're criminals over here, you know, and the, you know, the brown people are coming from Central America and they're heading for our border. This is just so backwards, right? This is why I worry about that. You're right. It's not inevitable. Uh, uh, I, I don't think slavery would ever be reintroduced. I don't think uh, even in even in the most conservative United States, they'd repeal the vote for women. I can't imagine that happening. That seems impossible. But on the other hand, Roe v. Wade's about to be overturned and women are going to lose their reproductive choices for abortion. And, and then there's talk of, well, what about birth control? We, you know, cause that's a form of kind of an abortion. The IUD prevents the anyway and so on. You, you know, the story. So uh, <laughs> yeah, we have to be vigilant. Just give us some kind of your, your final closing big picture thoughts, the next thousand, 10,000, hundred thousand years, just kind of give us the, you know, the, the big history, uh, your last chapter, <laughs> what's it all mean? Well, I, 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 as I, I mean, as I was writing this and I became more and more convinced, which I'd been skeptical of before, frankly, that um, something like collective learning almost guarantees that we will over the next few centuries um, travel to other planets, but we will also start modifying ourselves um, at genetically perhaps mechanically. And what that that means, and I, I increasingly suspect this is a fairly powerful prediction we can make, that within maybe just a few centuries, um, we will start diversifying genetically, medically, um, particularly on other planets where um, people will, you know, different physical attributes uh, or mechanical attributes will be necessary. So as a species, we will start both migrating and diversifying. Now, actually, that's a sort of story we've seen all before in human history, but the diversification this time will be under a considerable degree of human control. Um, and the further you project into the future, um, we, we, we at the moment cannot conceive how we could travel to nearby, nearby uh, star systems but uh, it seems hard to imagine that, that um, we won't develop the technologies needed to do that sometime in the next few centuries. So I think it's realistic to assume that within you know, a thousand years or two, we will be sending colonies to other star systems. So eventually that we will, we will sort of populate the galaxy. But as we do so, we will become more and more tribal, um, more and more diverse. And that probably means... Uh, the emergence of new forms of tribalism. But if the tribes live light years apart, (laughs) then, um, you know, that that may not be a recipe for the sort of wars we've seen on on a single planet. Um, And if if we start migrating, then that that also means that the dangers of the... You mentioned the Fermi paradox, the danger that, as a species, will wipe ourselves out... uh, are, are re- indeed reduced as we travel. But I also agree with, with your, your friend who said, if we see traveling uh, to other planets as a solution to the problems we face, that does not promise a very good future indeed, because it simply means we'll, 
will pollute planet after planet and have to keep moving, yeah, you know, as, as we, you know, a wave of destruction keeps just behind us. So, so we also have to imagine um, that humans get good at learning the things that need to be done, the limits that need to be observed um, to manage a planet, beginning with planet Earth and later on the much more difficult, vastly more difficult challenge of managing planets like the, 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 the Moon or Mars. Uh, they, but then eventually, you know, Human history will, I guess, end. At the, you know, we don't can't define the point, the point at which we become so diverse that it's really it, it doesn't make sense for us to think of of these as human beings. But they will be proto humans. They will be our descendants. Um, and then once you start shifting the scale again to astronomical and cosmological scales, then you start thinking about the you know, the future of the universe as a whole. And the, the amazing thing is that the cosmologists have some pretty good ideas uh, about this. And we, if you think about the likely future of the whole universe, then this astonishing idea emerges that we live in a very young, a sprightly young universe, which has bags of energy, um, lots of creativity, um, that era of creativity will eventually end. Um, star building will eventually cease. Um, galaxies will drift further apart because the rate of expansion of the universe is increasing. And so we can imagine vast, absolutely inconceivably long periods of time in which all the interesting things in our universe seem to be slowly dissipating or running down. Now, none of us will be there. Um, but at the moment, that looks like the future of the universe. And the remarkable thing is, here, if you're dealing with cosmology, strangely, you're dealing with trends that seem to have a degree of regularity that allows reasonably confident prediction. Um, so we can talk about the end of time. And that's one of the reasons I loved writing this book, because um, in, the, in, the, in my previous book, Origin Story, I was talking about the beginnings of time and about, about processes up to the present moment. Um, and now we can actually talk about the end of time, too. Yeah, that's a perfect place to end, David. I loved your book. I, I think it's up there with like Carl Sagan's Cosmos in terms of its almost spiritual uh, kind of taste to it because you're dealing with the biggest questions of all that we all deeply care about. And now science gets to have a voice in that conversation. And I think that's really wonderful. I thought you presented that beautifully. So thank you for your work and thank you for your book. And uh, all right. Good talking to you. Thanks for coming on the show. Thank you for a delightful conversation. I really enjoyed it. <laughs>